Yo bien dormí. Mano, mano. Yo 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 Okay, good morning. <laughs> so, we are here, here to uh, kind of give, give uh, an afterword uh, to, to a series that had a plenty of interest, uh, obviously, this week, which is about Hitler and images of Hitler, and most of them done during Hitler's lifetime. So, it's, it's, it's quite a treat. For some, for some reason, there were they will be productions, except the Chaplin film, the great Chaplin film, the great dictator. But, but anyway, we have here Olaf Möller, we have here from, from Cologne, when I is from Paris, both of them know the subject very well and know the thematic very well. And, and to start this show, uh, we might uh, screen a sh short excerpt from a film that was kind of was all the time in the program but then was omitted from the program because because it was too, too long somehow it was, it's a three hour film so so uh, this unique film was not, not shown this time it's called Fall of Berlin by Mihal Chiureli Soviet Union 1940-49 and for some reason the Russians are kind of uniquely talented for um, impersonations so we'll see now a short, a short excerpt of, of Tureli's Fall of Berlin. Okay. So, so as the first actor to... parce qu'il dure trois heures, donc il est chaud. Donc, on ne le voit pas en entier, on va le voir. Русские прорвали нашу оборону у Зеловских высот. Необходимо принятие экстраординарных мер. Вы, я вижу, полагаете, что война уже кончена. Вы близорубки, Шеф. Наоборот, на всю войну обстановка еще не складывалась для нас столь благоприятно. Пройдете в бомбоубежище, мой фюрер. It's a film which has, has amazing likes of both both Hitler and Stalin, and to much more, uh, much bigger degree, degree, also material of Hitler. Hitler, that it's not, it's known as the most famous Stalin film, and, and that was the kind of specialty of, of, of that time because, as Andre Bazin wrote, that it's a unique situation in history that the living statesman is giving giving serious and biographical films where he is. While he's still, still in power, there are films made about him. And then on the contrary, Hitler films were made out of Germany. I don't know of any German fiction film with Hitler. No. 
No, not during this lifetime. I think the first. I think really the first fiction film um, of, let's say, German language provenance, meaning Germany and Austria, was actually the letzte act by Georg Wilhelm Palmstein. So it's, uh, yeah. No, I mean, it would have been pretty much against the Nazi policy of, uh, <coughs> let's say, propaganda to have a Hitler movie. But, I mean, considering the extreme importance of documentary cinema in Nazi Germany, portraying, portraying Hitler and making icons of Hitler, so to speak, was very much a thing for documentary cinema, not for fiction. So we had, had one French film and then we had several American films. Why would you say, say Americans produced so many? They were mostly B productions, I said, I said, but anyway, they were clearly more than anywhere else. What, what made that? Well, it's part of, it was part of the propaganda policy to have a caricature of Hitler. You've seen the film by um, Vanderbilt. And the sound is uh, the sound of Hitler's speech is completely blurred, which made for uh, part of the image, part of the Hitler's image outside of Germany that his voice was like uh, dogs barking. You had the same you had the same thing in Jean Renoir's uh, La Vie Est à Nous, for instance. You had the same speech by Hitler. I, I think the Spielberg speech <laughs> and Hitler is dubbed by a, a dog. So using Hitler as a caricature, as a serious caricature, was part of the, uh, part of the idea. You have ridiculous films like uh, this film where um, Ward Bond, Warren Heimer, and I don't know who else go to, the, to Germany to win a reward of one million dollars to and kill Hitler, and they, they shave off his mustache so he gets killed by his own man. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So uh, you have that sort of thing, and he's always played either by extras or by a very poor actor. I mean, Karl Eckberg, who has the distinction of playing Hitler in uh, Citizen Kane, Manhunt, and um, a character on uh, Once Upon a Honeymoon. Uh, was a non-actor. He was just a he was just figure, and uh, Bobby was certainly Robert Watson. Bobby Watson was no great actor either. Although he actually gave the most complex um, range of Hitler performances, in contrast to Fritz Dietz. I mean, Bobby Watson and Fritz Dietz were probably the the biggest Hitler actors because they. Fritz Dietz in Eastern Europe and Bobby Watson in the US. I think both among them played Hitler more often than anybody else. And it's quite intriguing to see that Bobby Watson often tried to do something else with Hitler, while the Fritz Dietz performance is essentially always the same. Mm -hmm. um, many of these, uh, these uh, films uh, are, are somehow con uh, concerned by in a way, um, on the way to, um, to presenting history as a play, as a theatre, mm -hmm. which I found interesting, uh, especially the film today called, called The Magic Face, <coughs> which will you, see, you will see in, uh, this evening, but, but it's an it's a interesting conception that somehow world history, when it's still in the making, then it is presented as a big, big play, as a stage, and it's, uh, it's logical because because so much stagecraft was behind these dictators. But, uh, <coughs> yes, but the interesting thing is the comparison between what the German, what the Americans did and the and the Soviet film did, because uh, the Soviet was th were taking the theater very seriously, and were making, uh, were using this as Piotr Fagrov said last uh, the other day, were using different kind of actors, I want, and so a little later I might do uh, a comparison between uh, socialist realism and prepared a, a small montage of, uh, of an alternative, socialist realism offering an alternative to capitalist realism, as Max Ophüls used to say, and um, it might be interesting. Yeah. And then, and then the John Farrow theme is also also kind of going through these films. The John Farrow who saw so, so the whole whole Hitler thing as as a gangster player, play of gangster, very very logically came 
from 1920s and showed it as, as it could be a Warner Brothers film about the ascendancy of, of a gangster, uh, a story of uh, James Cagney going to the top in the gangster hierarchy. Another feature, another interesting feature, which is not in this program but was shown <coughs> several times here in Berlin, Bologna, is that Hitler was a subject of films about other possibilities of history. What if uh, the Soviet produced in the in the one year in which they produced anti-Nazi films, the Soviet produced four or five films about. This, uh, about Nazi Germany invading Soviet, the Soviet Union. There was one for the army, which was shown here. If Yesli is after Vaina, by Yefim Zigan, if tomorrow, if war came tomorrow, there was one about the navy, one about the aviation, and each time, uh, of course, the Nazi invaders were beaten immediately, and in one of them, in one of them, the, um, the Red Army went as far as Berlin and created a socialist state in Berlin. But not only that, you have a lot of, it's called Ukraine, Ukraine. what if the South had won the Civil War, what if Hitler had won World War II, but you have a lot of them even before the war. You have won the White Illness, I think it was shown. Yeah, here. it was shown, yeah. Uh, white Illness, which, Hugo is, Hugo Haas. Hugo Haas, which is not exactly about Hitler, but it, but it's a transparent dictator. Of course, you have the Chaplin film, The Great Dictator, which is not about Hitler, but which is also about a possibility of history. Mm. Uh, you have also a possibility of history, which aborts very quickly, but which is a possibility of history at the beginning of Fritz Lang's Manhunt. Uh, and you have a, a lot of films um, about what if, which you never have about uh, Stalin or about... Uh, about uh, American history, you have a few of those films in the during the crisis here, but never about historical figures. It would be quite intriguing to see how this might square with certain tendency in Japanese kind of semi uh, popular fiction of the twenties, because there was actually a whole subject of uh, popular fiction devoted to what if with possible wars with the United States, and indeed. Um, the attack on Pearl Harbor should have been not a secret, uh, not a surprise to anybody because it was actually a bestseller. So what the Japanese did was actually make a bestseller adaptation to a certain degree, which might sound cynical, but it was one of several different, let's say, ways of trying to imagine how a war, how a war against, against the U.S., and it was clear that there should and has to be a war against the U.S., might play out. I think even I think there's even an auto planning of film that alludes to that. Uh, I think so. In Hans way. No. Yeah. Is court martial of Billy? Oh, no, no, we should be Billy, Billy Mitch, yes, yeah. of course. But this is this is a funny fascinating remark because it shows that we could get here a series of films, ten let's say ten films from the twenties and thirties where the whole outcome of the uh, Second World War would be depicted almost to the detail. I mean that the uh, films like Things to Come, it predicts, it, it was made in 1936 and it predicts the beginning of World War to 19, 1940. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, almost uh, accurate to the point. No, but I mean, the, I mean that's one of the scary things if you really get into the interwar period. I mean how much how strongly all of these predictions about war, these war games, these mind games were around. So, I mean, if people say the war was inevitable, let's say there were a lot of people really trying very hard to make it inevitable, because this was really part of popular culture, which is something one shouldn't forget, I guess. And this uh, scenario game, again, continued, as we know, uh, continued in West German films in the 50s which were kind of imaginations that, that uh, or, or uh, the point of view was that Hitler and, and a few guys around Hitler, they were the guilty ones, the criminal minds, guilty ones, and otherwise German people was innocent. Actually, so that was in that regard, the Papst film is super interesting, because actually the Papst film is far more condemning than most other films um, of that period with regards to uh, Germany. I mean, we should not forget one thing. Um, the film is from is actually an Austrian production from 1955. 
kind of shot back to back with another film of Pabst um, about the Stauffenberg, it's uh, geschah 20. Juli, about the Stauffenberg assassination attempt. Now, um, remember, at that point in time, the Federal Republic of Germany was deep in a discussion about what was called rearmament, but what that should technically speaking just be called armament. The Federal Republic at that point did not have an army, and the films really hit in the midst of this discussion about whether the Federal Republic of Germany should take up arms again. So in that regard, the um, film um, The Lester Act is, is a pretty interesting film because it's true that normally the, I mean the, the standard scenario, so to speak, was there was the Hitler clique, the Hitler gang, so to speak. They had their evil henchmen, which was usually Gestapo and SS. And then there was the Wehrmacht and, well, Luftwaffe, etc. So the normal army. So the normal army was kind of okay. Not completely, kind of. So basically this was set apart to basically open up a space for, let's say, discussion of it, it's okay even after, after Nazi um, to have an army in Germany on German ground, on Federal Republic of German ground because the armed forces during the war behaved kind of honorably. Pabst actually goes pretty far in by showing how, um, how the duplicity and the involvedness of the army in, um, in well, let's say, the, the doings of, um, of, um, of Hitler, so to speak. <coughs> and it's, uh, I mean, the way he shows the general stuff and the willingness of just about everybody in uniform to collaborate, with the exception of Oskar Werner, um, it's quite striking. I mean, this is rather unusual at that point in time. And it probably makes for very particular viewing in that, in that regard, because, I mean, like most post-war films by Pabst, this one is an extremely dour, brutal, cold film that gives you frostbites on the eye. And it's very difficult to really navigate your, film, your way through that film because it's so cold and so really almost anti-everything. I mean, there's, an, there's a nihilistic abyss in that film that's quite something. I would uh, like to put the question about the, this genre that was almost, almost coming into shape. It was a Hitler genre, or Hitler imitation genre. And the main, the main thing there, very clear, is a certain degree of absurdity. The subject is, uh, is deadly serious, and these films are, as you have witnessed, they are plenty of fun, and they must have been then, even seen then, that nobody was kind of afraid of that, which might, might be a problem. And I found it uh, in this program book, the contemporary review by centers, which in a way fascinates me, written in 1933, at the time of the first in the, the, the reign of terror. It says that mediocre, verging on ridiculous, but also a fascinating genre. That's very, very bright, written uh, like, like that, uh, already then. So how do you feel about this, this degree of, of uh, ridiculous and, and this kind of balancing to, uh, between between parody and then, uh, of course, head horror. Well, all three, all, all three great countries, uh, not Japan, but the other three, were um, all trying to cope, trying to cope with uh, politics as representation. It was the beginning of something. It was the beginning of a, of a tendency that has taken enormous, uh, enormous strength now. That is practically all, uh, all powerful by now. Uh, you had uh, in the state you had a president that the cameras would not photograph and, uh, until he was seated in front of the audience. In fact, no, nobody knew that uh, Roosevelt couldn't walk and was walking on crutches or walking on his head with help. And in the Soviet Union, of course, you have uh, this. Uh, Potemkin village on the on the scale of a country, of a country, 
uh, whole country which was only representation, which was only which uh, the, the crucial crucial person in the 30s was a Sahana, of whom everybody knew that his feet as a, as a worker were completely fake, whether and uh, the rest was, was known at the time. I mean that it was right. it came as a revelation five years ago in the papers that it that, uh, finally came contemporary people all over the world thought, thought that this guy was. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, you, you see, you, you have so many, so many documentary films about um, celebration uh, on the Red Square, in which you know that uh, all the portraits, uh, all the portraits that you see crossing the Red Square, three or four are going to disappear uh, for next year's parade. But what is important is what is important is not the, that the man is eliminated, but that the, that the image is eliminated. If, uh, if somebody dies, if somebody, he should not have existed from the start. And so his image is a crime in itself. Uh, you know, um, we are not going to develop that because it's, uh, you have to see that in the, in the last part. We have a whole sequence about a frame in a film in which you have a black dot on, on the right side, you remember? Yeah. And you never know, you never know who the was that. The Grace Marker Yes, and uh, you never know who was that because, uh, um, and you have the story of the, uh, the editor woman who disappeared because he, she had forgotten to take out the nose of someone, uh, of Kiezhov, I think, the former um, Gepeuchi. Uh, so, it's uh, everything was becoming a matter of uh, representation. So all three countries, well, Japan was coping with it with uh, non-representation, uh, possibly, or um, uh, but all three, three other countries were coping with it in their own ways. Uh, I mean, um, Roosevelt was not Roosevelt on screen. He was uh, James Stewart or whomever, or whoever. Um, Stalin was Stalin played by several actors in succession, and Hitler was the Hitler of the newsreels. So it's, uh, it's interesting, it's, pre, it's really a pre-television, but it's a, it's a forerunner of television aesthetics, the way you are showing things as if they were the only extant reality in the world, and, no, and nothing else does matter, nothing else but those images, so are, that's why they're so important. Well, a little footnote with regards to Stachanov, I mean, this kind of, um, this kind of, let's say, Patyomkin village play went so far that Stachanov actually also got active in film politics in a certain way. Because, yes, and there is, he also wrote uh, actually a letter to the editor um, suggesting to make, um, to make um, filmed theater plays and filmed opera performances so that uh, culture could travel into the most remote villages so it's 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 kind of it's kind of intriguing the idea that the uber shop worker would also then come up and um, and make a stand for high high culture for the masses i was quite free out and i found that letter so. About the directors of these these American films, so so they they may be kind of near hack directors or something like uh, not uh, not having a very even career at least. Uh, I mean, Frank Tuttle, for instance, who made the brilliant Alan Land film, uh, this kind of higher oh, and yeah. the glass key, glass key. So it's a, something, but they seem to have. Uh, otherwise, there was kind of this uh, light level of uh, kind of. This fun aspect of this, this kind of B movie aspect, but they were serious people anyway about the subject. But they seem to have that background. That they were not not kind of that somebody nominated to the film and without no conviction about about Hitler. I think should say, remember that Tuttle, for example, has a strong left wing background. Yes, he was blacklisted. Yes. Almost blacklisted. Tuttle was not blacklisted. He named names. Yes, he named names. He but it, it, yeah. Yeah. it. Yeah. But, uh, but that, it means that he had a past. Uh, he, he had yeah. a past, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway, but I think apart from Farrell, a few of the top directors coped with the subject. Most of them used Hitler as an as an extra, as a, as a, as a newsreel character, or as a, you know, a, a, 
in those three films uh, I mentioned, those three films of the early 40s. Yeah. Uh, he <coughs> was just uh, a figure, an, an icon, standing next to Charles Foster King. But that's a, that's amazing. I mean, that it's a, it's a, uh, as all of us have seen Citizen Kane so many times. So it's always an amazing thing because it's it's one of the moments when you yeah. really think you have seen it. Yes, that it's, it's a trick picture that the spear hit it or but I guess it might also tell us something about certain ways of perceiving the Nazis or trying to, per, uh, to portray the Nazis, maybe also with relation to, let's say, what was going on in the US itself. I mean, for example, for me, the, the Vanderbilt film is far more interesting as a film about uh, the US and certain um, ideas that were around in the US at that time than, I mean, than about um, Germany and Austria. I mean, for example, I mean, let me just mention one detail. The, the casualness with which he portrays uh, Dolfus as, uh, as a, just a statesman is uh, quite staggering. I mean, Dolfus was, was a fascist. Austria had a, had a fascist government at that point. And what he calls the, the not Reichswehr, the, I can't remember what they are called, when he compares that to the, um, to the National Guard, I was thinking, does this guy know what he is saying? There right now, because he suggests that the National Guard is something of a band, uh, is, is is a militia of fascist thugs, because that's what this um, that, that was this um, this kind of uh, militia private army was. So it's 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 kind of intriguing for one thing to see uh, basically how certain things here were shown there or perceived there, but also I'm always thinking about okay, we also know that the Nazis had serious sympathizers in the U.S for example, that there was something like an American Nazi party, that they weren't exactly small. We should remember that, for example, um, the uh, 1936 Olympics <coughs> went essentially to, uh, to Germany because of uh, strong interventions from the National Olympic Committee of the US, which had a uh, very straightforward uh, Nazi sympathizer and anti-Semit as, um, as, as its head. I mean, so I mean, so I guess often that the that the idea of playing Hitler for comedy or in this kind of drama tropes is also a way of trying to negotiate the very different aspects and sympathies inside the U.S. My my guess. Okay. Well, I I would say we should see the Hitler film, the American Hitler film, really in the context of American films with Nazis. Because yeah. then, uh, if you mention that, there is a film by John Reinhardt. Mm. About Nazi, about the Nazis in in, um, in the States, yeah. and there is a, there is a major film all through the night, which is a Warner Brothers film, which is yeah. an A movie uh, about Nazi conspirators in uh, in forty long before before Pearl Harbor and so on. So it's uh, it's difficult to talk about Hitler in American film out of context, whereas yes. you can talk about Hitler in Soviet film as a kind of Hitler or mm. Stalin yeah. or both as a subgenre, as we have seen, as we've seen the other day with uh, Schweik and uh, with the uh, war, uh, the fighting screen, al uh, screen albums, and uh, we've seen with, uh, with the excerpt of uh, Fall of Berlin, etc., etc. That's, at that point, that is kind of a subgenre which turns up again much later with uh, Oswald Bostenje, this horrible yeah. five-part movie made uh, during the Brezhnev era by a director who then would make the official film for the Moscow Olympics, uh, and he was uh, okay. who was actually also a KGB officer. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Very good. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's, let's uh, go for a moment to the specific detail of the Soviet approach. How would you define Bernardis? And you are, you are also presenting something now. Yeah. No, it was pretty, well, okay, this was, uh, as I said, it was a kind of uh, alternative representation, an alternative to the Hollywood mode of uh, showing politics or showing... Uh, showing politic figure, political figures and so on, and uh, it had to do, I, wa I, I prepared a kind of a mini dossier on one of the actors, of, in my opinion, the best Hitler performer until uh, Bruno Ganz, whom I haven't seen as a part, but Bruno Ganz certainly is a great actor. So uh, the idea is, uh, has to do with, uh, with uh, Bertolt Brecht's 
uh, diary note then in Hollywood that uh, Kortner, Fritz Kortner cannot find a part because people laugh at him when they see film tests with Fr Fritz Kortner. They just laugh because he rolls his eyes and Brecht notes that only, only Negroes are allowed to roll their eyes and to act in the way that Brecht calls acting in American films. The rest has to be naturalistic, neutral acting, which is not exactly the same situation as the Soviet film, in which we, you still had, because of the theatrical tradition, you still had a very strong, imp, uh, a very strong impulse in, in acting. <coughs> but uh, Sergei Martinson, this uh, Sergei uh, Alexandrovich Martinson, uh, was an actor with an interesting background, and he remained an actor. He was not attached to the Hitler part, although he acted in three films in this role. You've seen it in Schweig. He was earlier on in one of the Fighting Screen albums, and uh, we're going to see a, clips of him, a few clips of him as an actor. So, uh, Martinson was, first and foremost, a Meyerhold actor, and he was in the original Fex Fabric, uh, Fabrica Actiora, by Kozintsev, Trauberg, and Yudkevich, which explained the connection to Yudkevich in the Schweig film. And the interesting thing is that, that he always was an eccentric actor, no matter what he was in. I think one of his last performances was in Daniela's uh, 33, which was kind of a moment, which was kind of a topical film, more or less banned, and then again, cult film, and so on and so forth. So Martinson is interesting because he takes a part of Hitler seriously, but as a caricature. He does something, he does other things, bigger than life things, that uh, Savelyev, the actor acting uh, Hitler in uh, Fall of Berlin, does not do. Savelyev is more in the, the vein of Arlene Skoda in the Leicester Act, playing a hysterical Hitler, but a realis realistic, hysterical Hitler, whereas um, Martinson is completely bigger than life. So I've prepared the, those five or the six clips showing in the first place Martinson's appearance in his very first feature film, Giorgio Bocadesio, The Devil's Wheel by Cousin Seven Trauberg. Then uh, Martinson playing uh, a satirical German, a bad German, but not at all in the same vein as uh, his Hitler. It's an intelligent German, corrupt, intelligent, and uh, it's a very interesting attempt by director Boris Barnett in Bojvik Razvechika, uh, exploit, of a, exploit of a secret agent, two years after the war, to go against the grain of the German, the caricatural German. Uh, Barnett himself plays an intelligent German general, whereas, whereas two years before in Odnazhny Nordschild, he had played um, caricature of a German general. This time, he's an intelli intelligent, aristocratic general who looks very much, uh, very much like Paulus surrendering at Stalingrad in the Soviet newsreel. And my idea is that he was in influenced by the newsreel of Paulus. And so you have this this scene with uh, Martinson as a German called Pommer, which is kind of a funny inside joke, perhaps. And then you have three clips, uh, three or four clips of uh, Martinson as Hitler in Treti Udar by Savchenko, third blow. the third blow or the third assault, where you have Martinson as a Meyerhold eccentric actor and where you have another <coughs> Stalin than the fall of Berlin, than the Ciaurelli Stalin. Ciaurelli had Gelovani, a Georgian actor with a Georgian accent, that was well known, Stalin's Georgian accent, and um, mannerisms, and humor, etc. And the actor in Tleti uh, Udar uh, is uh, Diki, who was a Stanislavski actor, and who had been jailed for a few years before playing Stalin. And he was, at, he was met, a, few, a, former, a former detainee, a former tsek, met him once and said, how did, how did you dare play this monster? And he answered, I did not play him, I created him. And in fact, Diki plays Stalin not 
as a great genius, but as a tragedy emperor, as a, a Shakespearean character without any accent, and uh, just uh, when you see the monu monumental Stalin. So you will have, uh, as you have in a few Soviet films, a comparison between the Mayhol style and the Stanislavski style, which also tells a lot about the way uh, Soviet propaganda wanted to show, wanted to show historical or actual actual political characters. The film was made after the war. It was made in '48, a year I think before Fall of Berlin. It has, I think, some of the most spectacular battle scenes ever filmed. Uh, but what we're going to see, of course, are those are those intimate scenes. So we're going to see in a row. Uh, those uh, those five six clips. Uh, only one one is uh, without one is silent. Uh, the Boris Barnett is uh, subtitled in French, and the other are without any translation. I apologize for the bad quality of the Etude, which was downloaded, of course, which is not not agree with what our colleagues from the archives have, have said about showing the films in the original state, but that's the way it is, okay, so we can show. Okay, please, have the excerpts. It's five minutes in all. I'm sure that you've all understood. d'avoir un petit morceau de fond sous-titré. The Devil's Wheel, 1926. Father Kadoshnikov on the left, whom you've seen in Ivan the Terrible. Войскам отдельной Приморской армии удалось создать плацдарм и закрепиться у города Керч. И здесь южнее, у Эльтигена. Так, на четвертом украинском фронте. Генерал Васильев не смог прорваться дальше северных окраин Армянска. Упорное сопротивление. Немцы непрерывно подбрасывают свежие части. Войска генерала Крейзера ведут упорные бои в межозерных дефиле.
Вот, фронт прорван. Наша техника тонет в грязи. Я бросил все, чтобы спасти хотя бы часть людей. Кто мог подумать, мой фюрер, что они начнут свое наступление так рано, так внезапно, в грязь, в распутицу. Ведь сейчас март, мой фюрер, только март! Надо бы, товарищ генерал. Горка своя. Севастополь держать. Все атаки должны быть отбиты. Я не могу ручаться, фюрер. В отставку! Вас заменит генерал Альмендингер. Альмендингер? Да поможет ли Севастополь надо держать. Надо держать. Надо держать! Ну, держи! Hitler really dancing like he does in the first, in the devil suite, round the lotus sing completely. But uh, it was interesting to have a thinking Stalin instead of an all-knowing Stalin in comparison to a puppet, a complete puppet, near the, near the eccentric ethnic style and near the cartoon, near the cartoons of the other day. Well, I would be interested to, to know your opinion about the real uh, deeper ideas in these films because uh, even if they were lightweight so as we know from the case of Chaplin because it was all serious and incredible film so, so it's full of insights that later had been kind of confirmed by scientific studies about Hitler and about the nature of Nazism and so on so it's it's amazing film but do these films have that we have seen here do they have something that strikes you that it's a real revelation that only film can in a way convey about historical personality. Difficult to say, I mean... You're asking the question, I'm sure you have an opinion. No, 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 I, I, I look here two wise men and I'm, uh, I suppose you have to ask. <coughs> Well, there's not one masterpiece among those films. Let's, uh, let's be clear about it. The only, the only masterpiece about Hitler is the first one. It's a, it's a Chaplin film. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't think there, there is one single film that could be called something. There are films about Nazism, fiction films, and documentary films that might bring something, like uh, Jonathan mentioned the other day, uh, Ordinary Fascism by Mikhail Rom to non-fiction film. There are films, fiction films that might bring bring us some, uh, something. Those films are really the products of uh, a political uh, a political uh, agenda, which was showing the heroism of the Soviet people, or which was uh, which was showing the, a caricature of the enemy. In the case of the in the case of the American films, where uh, Hitler actually was a cartoon character because he was farther away than Japan. He was, he was not such a close enemy. He was not, the, he was not Pearl Harbor. He was not Dojo. And uh, so he could be 
made fun of uh, by Tex Avery or uh, Walt Disney or uh, B films without any any problem. Uh, whereas the films about Japan are much more racist if you look at Milestones. Uh, yeah, Prisoner. Uh, I forget. I forget the title. I mean, Prisoner of Japan. But uh, uh, that's all more. And uh, no, 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 no. I meant a, an A film. Uh, anyway, the, the racism, anti-Japanese racism in American films is much, is much more blatant. Purple Heart. Purple Heart. Right. Thank you. <coughs> it's a, which is really an outspokenly racist film, and uh, so it's a major film. It's not just a newsreel or a training film for the army. So you have, you have those things, whereas uh, Germany was, of course, there was uh, our, uh, there were the training film like our, um, our prayer, Know Your Enemy Germany, uh, they, which, which was a problem film which was not released because it was, uh, because it came after the war when reconciliation was the order of the day and not uh, the eternal enemy. But uh, the situation was different, it was not next door, but not your, your next door enemy, whereas in the, in the Soviet film it's your next door enemy, um, which you see a lot in the uh, fighting film, uh, film uh, fighting screen albums, in which you have a lot of things about daily life, occupation, uh, people, simple people reacting to occupation, and uh, even in feature films. You had that a lot, of, you know, of course, in uh, Raduga, Donskoy's Raduga, uh, and, uh, and she defends her country, and uh, Rome's, Abraham Rome's invasion, and so on. So those films really are close to the enemy, which explains a lot about the caricatural aspects of the, the serious caricature that you have in the, in the representation of uh, German generals. I was fascinated with the the presence of Alexander Nevsky in all those cartoons, mm -hmm. maybe three of them at least, no. the other day, uh, cartoon and the, not only the, not only Alexander Nevsky, but the new but the Prokofiev music, yeah. which was something fascinating, so obviously he, cre he created this anti-Nazi propaganda before it was the order of the day, or when it would be, before it was really as topical as it, as it became three years later. Well, with regards to Japan, I mean, um, it's, I think it's also pretty, it's not exactly a secret that the war against Japan, from the American point of view, was an extremely racist war. It began back home. We know that, I uh, think, it was Roosevelt, basically signed, I mean, this internment. Um, um, yes, I mean, that was really done from a very clearly racist point of view. I mean, there's a, there's a study of uh, Roosevelt's racism that was involved in the creation of, um, of this enemy, so to speak. And it continued. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a Jap there's an American film called Let's Have a Drink that was basically made in May 45, which was a celebration film about um, the end of uh, World War II in, in Europe which essentially is a call, for a call to genocide, eradicate the Japanese race, full stop. <coughs> so, and on the other hand, I mean, this, if you look at Japanese films at that, from, that point, from that time, there's very little you could really react to, so to speak, in a similar fashion, because what would you react to? I mean, the Japanese, the Japanese Second World War, the 15-year war, was completely differently constructed. It had an invisible center with the major uh, with, uh, with the Shoah Emperor. The army was basically always relating to him. It was really a, a people's war as a construction. So what do you want to react? On the other hand, the Germans were quite um, <coughs> quite charismatic dudes where you could actually to whom you could react quite easily. I mean they are all almost living caricatures. You see them and it's it's so easy to make fun of them. So it's really not a surprise that they that there is so much fun made about them because they do look so weird. On the other hand, I mean the douche also look pretty fucking weird. So I'm sorry. So the Berna used an prisoner's theory as caricature. It's a very apt one. And as we know, the the Hitler figure has has a very rich afterlife. Oh yes, there are plenty of him, but but then he becomes kitsch, and he's in children's games and so on. He's kind of incarnation of evil, and then often very funny character. And 
There's of a whole the, uh, present day youngsters uh, <laughs> don't know so well, well about the background and for him, for them he's such a small character. But then, then we have Monty Python and so on. So I should say that there's a whole scene, subgenre, hell scenes featuring Hitler. I mean, as I, as I mentioned while presenting the Pfaffenbichler film, uh, Christoph, Barbara and I did, a, did together with Norbert a lot of research into the subject of where does Hitler pop up and when. And Hitler very often pops up in hell, of course. He's a really stable figure there. Sometimes to go with Gandhi, sometimes to go with Stalin. There's really one film where he pops up to go with Gandhi, which is sublime. Um, no, not in that film. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you do have, I mean, suddenly Hitler's popping up all over the world. I mean, there is, for example, a very good Indian Hitler. It's in a super classic of uh, Hindi cinema, Sholai, where a prison warden who's completely styled on Hitler. There is a Filipino comedian who created a character that is half Hitler, half Himmler. And, um, I mean, incredible. And, I mean, this guy then with this character did films where this Hitler Himmler character plays for example Bruce Lee. There is a, there's a Pinoy martial arts movie with a Bruce Lee kind of dude who has, has a swastika made of um, plasters uh, on his arm. I mean, wow. I mean the guy is so popular that there are now tribute comic, uh, comedian acts basically remaking his most famous stints. Yesterday I was told that there is a, a, another Hitler in health in, in Iran. So, I mean, Hitler became this really this weird, weird character. Actually, Italy also gave us a very great Hitler in an Adriano Celentano movie, Sio Adolf in Arte Führer, one of the greatest film titles in the history of cinema. <laughs> so, and then, then lately there are there are, of course, this, this series also series uh, among all these. There are TV series and many great actors like like Guinness did Hitler and so so it's kind of. Did you see the Alec Guinness as Hitler? Have you seen Sublime. It? Yes. I mean, no, I mean, actually, Norbert Pfaffenbichler and I were discussing that. In our vision was of our what we what our shared insight is that. The more an actor makes Hitler himself, or remakes Hitler after himself, the more interesting he gets. And Guinness has really nothing like this, I'm sorry, I have to get a bit insulting now, this really shitty, unwatchable performance by this doofus Bruno Ganz. I'm sorry, I mean, great actor, but this is absolutely unwatchable kitsch. This is bleh. And uh, really an insult to poor Hitler. Um, no, strike that. But, um, but um, uh, hit, I mean, the, the, the obvious thing is that Gans tries to imitate every mannerism of Hitler, and it's, it's simply ridiculous. On the other hand, really, um, Guinness is really taking up Hitler, and he's basically, Hitler becomes Guinness, so to speak, which is really intriguing to say. The Anthony Hopkins, by the way, also very good Hitler. I mean, really, I mean, you can see really classic British theatrical work at this historical character, and they are really great. But isn't that something you know, one, one could see, one could see about uh, every character, every actor, absolutely working on a uh, on a character? Absolutely. But I mean, it's really, I mean, it's really not basically like like imitating. I mean, imitating Hitler to come to an essence, to one essence of him, but really making him your own. And it's, I mean, Guinness did it really sublimely. And what is interesting here, it's, it's very obvious, but I still say it, is that, that Hitler, out of the, all, all the historical character of 20th century, he really <laughs> has the longest life yeah. on screen. Yeah. And very much unbroken. I mean, there's barely a year where you can't find a Hitler. Yeah. I mean, I mean when, 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 we were, when we started work on the film by, uh, by Norbert, Norbert had 30 Hitlers. When we finished, I mean, we were something with 150 Hitlers and still counting. So it's, uh, there's a lot of that guy around. So if you take as a point of comparison, the, the leaders of the Second World War, so Roosevelt was, uh, was hardly ever seen on screen. And when he was seen, like in a Mike Curtis film, yeah. so you saw only his back. back yeah. And yeah. you heard his voice or imitation voice. He was shown as that this that great, that the, as, as, as American, that Jesus, was, Jesus Christ was shown in the middle film. That yeah, that, that, that was the, the, the strength of the American film, that, you, that, that Roosevelt was incarnated in all, all characters. Or Lincoln, yeah. for that matter. Yeah. Lincoln was incarnated. All leading characters.
ideas in, the, in American films are the embodiment of the American so-called democracy and, uh, and of their leader. Which is actually so, you don't, so you don't need to represent them, yeah. except for Lincoln. Which, was an icon. Point, yeah. Which to a certain degree also goes for Japan. I mean, there was a there was basically there was actually a ban on showing the Showa Emperor on uh, on the screen. And I mean, with Neon um, Noichiwa Nagaihi by uh, Okamoto, they really had to negotiate with uh, I think the Lord Privis, the Lord Seal Privy, or whatever it's called, one member of very close to the to the, Japan, to the imperial family, what they could actually show, and they showed an arm that was at that point in time a massive sensation, 1967, 67, I think, 67, 68 or so. And uh, so, but again, there the whole dynamic is the whole people is the emperor. So you have millions of images of the emperor because, I mean, every Japanese person on this planet was supposed to be an image of the emperor. So. That's why you never have to have, have to show him because he's he's everywhere, kind of. That's the idea. <coughs> and of course, very very few new things come. And when they come, when there comes comes an interesting new film like like the film of Alexander Sokur or Moloch. So you, it's 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 something that it has the aim of showing the triviality, the the banality of of the inner circle of of uh, Nazi regime. Which is basically the same what what John Farrow was doing. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm generally intrigued by um, the films from the 40s because uh, I mean, to a certain degree, nothing new under the sun. I'm tempted to say, and I'm, I was I'm really surprised to see stuff in the films where I wouldn't have thought that these would have been topical back then. For example, recently I was talking with somebody and mentioning Gedi Rauber, the big love of Hitler. And I mean, German woman in her 30s had never heard of her. But obviously she, she was well known enough uh, back then as a, as a figure to basically make her a character and actually not, a, not an unimportant character in the film. I mean, I'm, in general, I'm always surprised what these films suggest to us, what people probably knew. And um, yeah. Okay, that's that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <boy. laughs> Don't run away. We have something special for you. <laughs> Soviet <laughs> submarine sharks. Stay, and you will be regaled. One except silly. <laughs> Пожар получит 
Штык, огонь и свинец, Получит фашизма бесславный конец.
соглашение между правительствами СССР и Великобритании о совместных действиях в войне против Германии. 